Um, let's see. Uh, let me say that every Thursday, Justice for Mario Woods Coalition meet at SEIU 1021. Um, address is 350 Rhode Island, enter on Kansas Street. We meet from about 6 to 9. I know it's a quite long meeting, but, you know, just getting tired of the politics of here in San Francisco. I don't go to many of the meetings anymore at City Hall because one, I find them distasteful, I find them disgraceful, and to hear public comment, you know, you go up and you can't even state how you feel, you can't even get your thoughts out, two minutes, your two minutes is up, and you know, they shut down the microphones. It's just a degrading process. And I'm too proud to continue to go to the city commission meetings and be degraded because my community is fighting against degradation. And so what we have done with the Justice for Mario Woods Coalition is that you have to come to us. We have tribunals. And so we demand that the politicians come to the community and speak to the community. And we're not going to say you only have two minutes. So we've had DA Gaston, we've had uh, Jeff Adachi, we've had the Cox Review Board from the DOJ, we've had Board of Supervisors, you know, all everyone has come to the community. And I think what happens is, is because really the political scene in San Francisco is so disconnected with the community and we as a community have to rise up against that because we are the people they work for us the city hall is our building and we have gotten away from that because it's an intimidating process and we continue to be intimidated and through that intimidation we sit down and so i'm saying to all of you here is that you have to become upstanders you have to begin to stand up and fight for your rights. And we can't continue to be bystanders and just sit by and watch what is happening to our community. And so that's one way that we're fighting against the political um, field of San Francisco. And you also have to know that Mayor Lee is not about the people. He is about big corporations and he's about, you know, giving tax breaks to the wealthy. And so the little people, constituents who used to mean something to a politician really don't mean a lot to a politician. And then those of us who fight on various fronts, we have to come out of our individual silos. And we're going to have to come and be uh, a collaborative and mobilize together because when you begin to look at it, all of these things are intertwined. The homelessness is intertwined with gentrification. Gentrification is intertwined with the lack of jobs for uh, black people here in San Francisco. It's also entwined in police brutality. Black people here in San Francisco represent less than 3% of the population, but represent 50 six percent of the jail population i mean the burns institute just um put out a report on the racial profiling the arrest records of san francisco african-american community that we are 11 times greater to be arrested than any other ethnicity in this city we are nine times greater to be sentenced we are nine times greater not to get uh pre-trial we, you know, no bail. And so when you look at African Americans in the city, we are the only group in San Francisco in which the population has declined. Every other ethnicity in San Francisco, their population has grown with the exception of black people. And over the last 10 years, it has been about maybe somewhere between 60 and 96,000 black people who have left San Francisco. And so these are things we have to begin to look at. And we, we shouldn't be afraid to look at them. We shouldn't be afraid to come to the table and, and work together as a community because it's gonna take all of us, as all the issues that we all are on this panel addressing, it's gonna take all of us to win. And with that win, I believe that we have to begin to work together. Thank you. 
Hello again. Um, tying back to something that Chris said, I also want to say, do not call the cops on your neighbors. That's what got Alexander killed. I was in the courthouse when the 911 caller gave his testimony. That was Justin Fritz. And he was doing so instigated by his partner, Tim Iskit, who when they passed Alex, Iskit saw a gun on Alex's hip. Uh, Justin Fritz didn't. But walking down the hill, he said, I think we should call him one, we should call him one, we should call him one, there's a gun at his hip. And so while Justin Fritz is on the phone, his partner keeps on giving him information. There, he's working himself into a frenzy to the point that Justin Fritz, by his own testimony, thinks when his partner's saying that uh, he has his hand on the hip, Justin Fritz said he imagined Alex Nieto was drawing his weapon as if in a kind of cowboy uh, style. And so what ended up happening is they had an imagination of an active shooter on the hill. They said, uh, he mentioned Sandy Hooks. And so, but when he calls the dispatcher, what happens is the dispatcher elicits certain information, including what is the race. And even, he's frazzled, he's, he says, and this is the 911 call, what? And she, and she says, African or Hispanic? He says, Hispanic. Um, and then there's a description of Alex Nieto that is given over the dispatch that could easily be profiled as a Norteño gangbanger. Of course, the cops say that they never profiled him this way. But in a sense, the 911 caller uh, created a, fulfilled his fantasy. He, had, he called the active shooters to the hill. And in his own 911 call, in his own testimony, he is terrified, fleeing from the hill as 59 shots are fired. And if you know how the hill is positioned, um, so the cops are positioned here, Alex is here, um, the 911 caller was off the side and he ran down a hill this way. The hill slopes this way. There's some eucalyptus trees. The 911 caller said the shots were being fired into the eucalyptus trees above his head as he felt the leaves falling over his head. So the, there was no concern for public safety at that moment. And those were the active shooters. They called active shooters in a one-sided gun battle. And I'm telling you all of this to just kind of position like what, what are what are police actually doing when they're called? And then in terms of specific policy <coughs> recommendations, we start working on these on the, um, since the second anniversary of Alex Nieto um, of his shooting on March 21st, 2016. We put these out and then they became a part of a conversation with John Avalos. And they have since um, been evolved a little bit. But one of the main ones that we're asking for is to modify the San Francisco PD general order in respect of use of force. And it's very specific. There are alternatives already in the general order about using how, how and when to use non -le uh, less lethal force or different weapons that are less lethal. But what is really significant and gets lost in the language is that it's not mandatory to use any other technique. It's not mandatory to use de-escalation techniques. We could put them in the SFPD general order, but until we make it mandatory, <coughs> their accountability con continues to be uh, based on what <coughs> judicial precedents and this language in the SFPD general order says, that basically, if they feel that their safety or the safety of others is threatened, and I believe it's um, a serious threat of bodily injury or, or death to themselves or to another, then that gives them a free reign to shoot. It doesn't matter what was happening, it didn't matter if they were, like in the Luis Gomera case, using beanbag weapons, which I actually think was a stupid idea anyways. But in any case, that general order has to be a target. I've also learned that that's, the Board of Supervisors can change that. Another thing that could happen is that the chief of police could issue bulletins in the same sense to make it mandatory and it would have the same effect. Something else that we could do is to radically increase the transparency of SFPD. California is, has one of the least, is one of the least transparent states in the country. There are states like Florida which are 
I would say 100% more transparent because you can just ask for any, any information and it will be given. And right now, um, the Police Officers Bill of Rights allows them to take out away any information from online. Once even complaints are, are not available, you really have to dig deep and ask these questions to have any understanding of how many complaints, about what, about what how do you define use of force, what are these incidents. And you might have heard of the Lino Bill. It's passed out of the Senate committee, um, but it is, I'm not sure it's gonna become legislation. If it did, that would solve a lot of the problems. But if it doesn't, that's another opportunity for the Board of Supervisors to act. Another question is, how do, are we gonna create independent investigations? Right now, we're, we're dependent on whether the DOJ cares about a case um, to have the Civil Rights Division come in. They have. The last we heard about it was Ferguson, I think Eric Garner too, I may be wrong about that, but it was certainly in the case of Ferguson. But in, in Chicago, that's right, thank you. Um, but in that case, I know, for example, that the district attorney, uh, George Gascon, just asked for funding to create a special investigation unit for police shootings. It, it calls into question whether that's independent, because the whole problem is the investigation between the district attorney and the SFPD um, it's not independent. They have a, co a cooperative relationship that's useful for other reasons. One, investigating a crime of some sort. They cooperate, that's what they do. But that also means that when you have a shooting, a police shooting, that cooperation acts against transparency. In the Alex Nieto case, they manipulated the crime scene. It's obvious. They manipulated the taser information. You have the crime scene investigation photos where the taser's off. You have uh, an officer testimony that the taser hadn't even been uh, on or, or fired. And so you have uh, uh, variations that lead you to understand that that crime scene was muddled with. And that's the same case in the America Perez Lopez case where in the town hall meeting, the police say that his body was on the sidewalk. But as soon as the alternative version from the witnesses came up and there were photographs actually from, taken by my husband from our, our window, where the bodies in the street, because they were trying to create a narrative. So it's really important to understand that that's key. How do we create independent and fair investigations? And then um, I think as finally as a, as a final point, well, two final points. I do really believe that we have to have some sort of victims and family services and restoration, immediate restoration, that we have for victims of crime, but it's not really readily available for other victims, family, friends, and, and witnesses. And one uh, idea for an action is that the approval of the budgets, the city budgets is coming up. And they are introduced in June, and they're approved in July. And so the current police budget is $450 million. And the Board of Supervisors has the ability to reserve, hold and reserve the use of certain budgets until certain conditions are met. So among these ideas that I'm putting out and the other panels are, are putting out, let's think about how we can hold the police budget until they meet our demands. Thank you. It's great, I second everything. Um, <laughs> Ditto. Um, so I just kind of returning to the Gongora story, you know, after um, after he was killed, what happened was is that the, both Supervisor Wiener and Mayor Lee came out and said, basically, in essence, homeless people are dangerous. That's what Wiener said, right? So we need to get rid of all these encampments citywide. And Mayor Lee ended up echoing those, the, those statements. And um, the, the encampment on Shotwell, specifically, where he was killed was um, was targeted. Um, you know, the police came with knives and slashed all the tents. Actually, Adriana was there. Um, and so, and was threatened as well. And, and you know, so this is, um, you know, just kind of building off of what Chris was saying earlier, we really need to halt the practice of how we're addressing encampments and how we are um, basically forcing people into the sidewalk shuffle where we're just pushing them from one place to another and doing it over and over again. It's not uncommon, you know, people will tell you, they get woken up three, four times a night and are forced to move. These are a lot of elderly people, a lot of disabled people, they're told that they have to you know, only have minutes to move all their belongings that they have left. If not, they're gonna be thrown in the hopper. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's absolutely brutal. So um, I just, you know, one of the action steps is we really have to come together forcefully and say, 
this is not an appropriate and humane way to address encampments. And the city either ignores them, and we're saying you can't ignore them. You, you have to actually you know, do outreach to folks. You have to ensure that they have sanitation, that they have bathrooms, that they have garbage service. Um, or else, this, because the other thing the city does is they, they purposely refuse, like they did on Division Street. We try to get bathrooms in there. We try to get garbage. No, 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 no. Reaches a critical mass, and then they just go in and do this massive sweep, and then people are pushed a block away, and then complaints into the city skyrocket. And so it's just it's just an absolutely insane um, policy that we have at this point. So this this legislation is really important, but actually force the city to not be so lazy to just push respond to a member of the public and just push people a block away, but that the city would actually have to have a relocation plan. They would have to provide housing for people temporary accommodations if the housing isn't available right away. They would have to be thoughtful about it. And if they weren't able to do that, they'd have to give an extension. Or if they wanted to ignore it, they'd have to do the bathrooms. And they wouldn't be able to wake people up constantly all night, every night. Uh, wouldn't stop them from cleaning. Wouldn't stop them from the other stuff. But you know, we, we really want to make sure that things are dealt with in a humane way. Um, secondly, um, we have, and, and, and a lot of what Adriana was talking about the, 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 the Board of Supervisors, yes, and that's one option. Uh, we also have the um, commissioners at the Police Commission. And right now, they are going to be the final, I, not the, you know, we can go to the Board of Supervisors, but they're the ones that are going to be voting on what changes that they put into the use of force um, uh, general orders. And there is a lot of variation in language. The, the, the Police Officers Association is pushing for zero accountability in those orders for police officers and community are pushing for something that's much more reasonable that mandates they use verbal de-escalation um, in those situations where it's appropriate that um, uh, you know use minimal force instead of you know this, this uh, these other kinds of languages that they can use um, so that is June 1st is the police commission is going to be they have a three-person committee um, that is Susie Loftus, um, Tippy, whatever his name is and um, uh, uh, and Petra de Jesus are going to be putting together what the recommendations are and then they're going to be at that police commission on June 1st. It's a Wednesday night and people can show up for that and really try to have influence on that. Throughout the month of June, this is items going to be going to the police commission and then they're going to be voting on it. Um, the other piece of this is the tasers and I didn't talk a lot about that, but um, just really quickly, you know, we, we are very concerned about tasers from our constituents perspective from homeless people who come in this constant contact um, and um, yes for anyone and I'm going to get to that as well but um, but um, you know these are weapons that were never regulated medically but that shut down your neurological system and um, what what they are is they have these probes that come out you have to be you have to be in relatively close range to people for them to use and then they insert themselves into the body and you have to have um, defibrillators on site because often the heart stops you have to have medical personnel remove them um, and it is a incredibly traumatic experience for people who um, who, who go through this and, it, and, and it's killed you know it's killed over 500 people um, and then all kinds of other injuries that I can go into but the interesting thing on this is is that in California there's very few independent studies all the studies are done by taser and they're all biased but the independent studies looking at tasers after they've been introduced in California um, the number of officer-involved shootings after tasers were introduced in departments in California, on average, <coughs> doubled, doubled officer-involved shootings. The number of in-custody deaths, sixfold, sixfold higher. In, in addition, all these departments across the country are starting to consider moving away from using these weapons because they weren't what they were said to be. So in places where they have removed them, they haven't seen then an increase in officer involved shootings after the tasers are removed so really what we're trying to do with the police department we're trying to say good police work right and having a weapon that um, you know that is this severe on people is not what we're talking about in terms of good police work so that decision is being made alongside the use of force and so it's really important for people to get involved in that there has not been a coalition kind of formed around um, tasers we're hoping to kind of you know, at least um, kick something off. We're going to have a meeting um, next Tuesday at 4 p.m. at 468 Turk, um, and we're inviting members of the public to come to just kind of at least scratch out a bare bones plan around um, strategy plan 
on, on how to address these and, and get them taken off the table. We've succeeded in the past of halting tasers um, two different times um, through a tremendous amount of hard work. Um, we, as a, we as an organization have not had, we, we, we don't have the resources to take on the fight that largely. Um, so we've been trying to get other organizations to step up. It has not happened. And so um, we're going to try this kind of, you know, last bit of time that we have to pull something together. Um, you know, it's a lot of stuff going on around homelessness as well. And so we're concerned about it because it so impacts our constituency. And, and, and so we're trying to, um, you know, trying to make it happen, but we got to halt it. So those, uh, those are some additional ways for people to get involved. Invite, invite questions because of the time. It probably okay. doesn't make sense to do all our card, fancy card thing. I think this is a good crowd. Go ahead and field, field some questions. And it is almost 8 o'clock, so I do want to be mindful of time, maybe another 10 minutes. Do folks feel okay with 10 minutes for a little Q&A with folks? Good. Sir. Yeah, well, I think we're in. <laughs> check, 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 check. It's on. Okay. It's on? Uh, no, it's on. Yeah. I can talk about it. That's all right. We got it. I think we have another issue that's more problematic in the city is that you can't trust the major newspaper, I wouldn't call it major, the minor newspaper, the Chronicle, <laughs> right. because they want to build this 5M project in this neighborhood, and that's going to make them a lot more money than their newspaper makes them. And so they're completely in debt with the administration. And so you have people like Devious Nevius and Slick Willie Brown attacking the homeless, attacking the Frisco Five, on a regular basis, so uh, you know, when uh, and I, I've had, I've gone there and I've argued with Audrey Cooper, and she's the last one who cares about anybody who's homeless. I mean, she cares as much as Scott Weiner, <laughs> and Scott Weiner is somebody I look today, and the amount of money he gets from the Police Officers Administrative Association, and Gail and Ron Conway is it, it, it sort of fills up half a page. So, yeah, we've got a lot of fighting to do. And, uh, you know, not to say that we shouldn't do it, but, you know, we have to take that into consideration, that that newspaper is opposed to everything we want to do. And that's not much of a question. There's <laughs> 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 a question there. Yeah. Oh, I want to ask a question about the change in the demographics. Uh, they say like 10,000 people are moving into San Francisco over the last few years, and, the, and that's part of the displacement gentrification. We're losing our folks. We're losing our, our, our sensibilities and our, 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 our everything we're talking about here. What my question is, so the gentrification is, I'll say, probably millennials, younger folks, higher income folks are moving in. You see it in the South of the market, it's so busy over here. How can we engage them in this conversation? Because, if, I'm, if we can, because they're, they're, I think they're targeted as the reason why. I mean, we realize the real thing behind this is real estate and the power behind it that affect the politicians. But if we're trying to get more voters, it seems like, you know, I, I feel like, how do we engage the, the, those new folks coming in? Because I, I, I hear from them that they want to help, but they're out there making those phone calls calling, get those homeless people off our streets. Any thoughts on that? Well, I can certainly speak for Hospitality House. I mean, one of the things that we've done, we've had uh, uh, every three or four months, we've had something called Talking Tech in the Tenderloin. Uh, it's an opportunity for local residents and tech workers to just talk to each other. Uh, they, and the goals are modest. We're starting first by just having folks in the same room talking to each other. Uh, but to at least underscore your point about the changing demographics, um, uh, the figures show that nearly 70% of the population increase citywide is in District 6. Um, and it's also ground zero for uh, market rate housing development. So, you know, we're kind of parachuting, you know, wealthier, wider, <coughs> younger, 
higher educated people to occupy smaller and smaller spaces, but more of them, and putting the squeeze on local residents. I mean, the, as we articulated, the inverse of displacement is entrapment. I mean, increasingly, we have people we, you can't afford to stay in San Francisco, nor can you afford to leave. I mean, increasingly, right, we've got more and more people trapped in a smaller and smaller area. So yes, this has real implications uh, both for our housing policy, but clearly for our political system and our law enforcement uh, policies as well. So at least one small idea is this idea of talking tech uh, in the Tenderloin. I don't know if uh, other folks. Well, I mean, like this this isn't going to be that helpful, except what not to do. But we did we, you know, we've been trying to figure out how to do, you know, this very question. And so one of the things we did is contact all the tech companies. Um, and ask if they would um, allow us to come and speak to them about homelessness. Um, and we have a speakers bureau, and you know, homeless people themselves can speak and stuff like that. Um, and we got zero, zero response. So um, I think that we got to figure out something else. So I'm sorry, I don't have a brilliant idea. <laughs> I don't have any ideas about that. <laughs> well, I think, you know, there's an additional point, too. Uh, there was a study just recently released by a group called Silicon Valley Rising and Working Partnerships USA and in Santa Clara County. And it's not surprising that there is increasing stratification and racism uh, in the hiring practices in the tech industry. So the higher paid direct tech jobs are going to white people and the lower paid jobs with less job security and typically uh, fewer benefits are going to black and brown people. Uh, if at all. <laughs> totally disrepresented in terms of the population. And so one of the things, one of the battles that we have to take up here is guarding against that and forcing, I mean, the culture of the company is only going to change if we get newer people in. If you're trying to be a good corporate neighbor, then you have to be more inviting and welcoming to your existing neighbors, the people who are already here. And so that's one of several points that we're trying to make in this small gathering of Talking Tech in the Tenderloin. And I'm encouraging folks to think about those opportunities in their own communities, right? To have these round tables, these informal discussions. Uh, between local residents, community residents, and newer arrivals about what it means to be a good community resident, what it means to be a good neighbor. Yes? Um, when is the talking practice session? Well, we just had uh, one uh, last week, Jesse, was it, it was last week. So we're trying to do it on a quarterly basis, so my guess is it would probably be August or September. We'll do another one. Uh, and one of the proposals that's on the table is, I mean, there's been a dismal um, uh, uh, effort to actually hire local residents. Um, I think two local residents have been hired uh, in the past three and a half years, two. So that's outrageous and unacceptable. And so one of the things that we're trying to push is this idea, if you're serious about changing the culture of your company, then you got to figure out, you know, how to hire people. And it's not good enough to say that, you know, local residents, you know, poor people, black and brown people don't have the requisite skill set. This is a tech field. Uh, you're smart people. How do we all get smarter? Yeah. Uh, and putting the onus back on them uh, to meet their obligation. Uh, they're receiving a public benefit. Their company is receiving a public benefit. Money that we don't get is money that we're paying. All right, and there's an obligation to meet uh, community standards and to actually give back to the community. Uh, yeah, I uh, just want to, uh, moving from uh, just a transitional uh, perspective into a transformational perspective, uh, we will be, the Idris Staley Foundation will be initiating a uh, campaign called the People's Campaign for justice and the purpose of that campaign is to replace the present and current police commission, uh, uh, which we see as a rubber stamp commission, also a cover up commission for murder. Uh, we're talking about community control of the police. I understand controlling the budget might, and it directly controls the police. So I want to control 
the police and with a democratically elected uh, civilian board with the power to investigate and fire subpoena offending officers. We don't see it as just, when we say police brutality, that means like, that conjures like just a few rotten apples on the tree. The whole goddamn orchard is rotten. And that's how we, we see it. So we want more of a transformation, looking at a transformational aspect that people, the, the police commission is uh, appointed by the mayor and the supervisors, which makes no, them accountable the to the mayor and the supervisors the and not to the community. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so my question, I don't want to speechify too much, but my question is to the panel. Would this panel uh, see this as a viable option and support uh, People's Commission, a democratic elected board, to oversee the SFPD? For me, yes. <laughs> oh, definitely, yes. And, and it's really um, kind of crazy because the board just unanimously um, re-commissioned Susie Loftus and Jesus to come back and serve another four terms without even questioning them about anything, which we find totally ridiculous. And so here we are every Wednesday, the community, going up to the police commission, complaining, knowing what they're not doing, knowing that they're, you know, as you say, a board, a commission just rubber stamped by the mayor and the board of supervisors. And yet you have a community who is crying out for help and you totally ignore, and all the board of supervisors unanimously uh, re convene Susie Loftus. I, I just don't understand that. And so we had a big issue with that. Um, we met with Avalos and, and Campos and, um, and others, and you know, we, we told them about um, what we felt. It, it was like, you know, well, we didn't know the community didn't want it. How did you not know the community <laughs> didn't want it? And every Wednesday, you have more people in the uh, police commission than you ever had. So, um, all right, all right, so that's yeah. a yes. Yes, yes, yes. 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 So, yes. Right. it's a yes. Okay. We will that's support okay. you. All right. Um, so, how do you, how do you all think we can help change public perceptions, uh, which obviously are mixed with racism and stereotypes of homeless people and poor people and people with psychiatric issues? You know, all these things that seem to inform both. Um, individual attitudes um, toward folks, police attitudes, and then support for police actions, which are so blatantly criminal and helpful, um, and, and unhelpful, to say the least. Um, and, and yet they get all of this political and public support um, for the police, <coughs> even when they do something that it just seems to be so blatantly outrageous, whether it's the racist texting or these shootings. What do you think we can do to, to move people's you know, that is that is a huge fundamental question, right? And I mean, that's what, what Joe was talking about earlier. Uh, the police department is a reflection of broader society. And so, you know, we live in a racist society. Uh, the police department is not immune from that. And so um, that's what we see as a reflection. And it's, um, it's difficult. I mean, some of the things that... Uh, and also, they're not part of, they're not residents of San Francisco. Yeah, that doesn't matter what they're working. Yeah. It's not like San Francisco's numbers. I'm not saying it. I mean, I, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so it, yeah. it's, it's, yes, that San would be Francisco helpful. Very nice. Right. I mean, if we. <laughs> <laughs> if, this is so that, yeah, right. So that, that, you know, that can be a part of it, I think, in terms of, you know, making sure that people are up and from the community that the police force represents and, and that kind of thing. But the other piece of it is, you know, um, there's this otherness that happens where there's a devaluing of human life. And I think a lot of our work really has to be to insert that human life value back into um, you know, the way people go around. And, and some of that work, and, and, and I don't know if all of it is, but certainly some of that work is making those kind of human connections. And you know, when, when people think about homeless people as only being people from out of town, um, they, there's an otherness. When they, when they realize that homeless people are actually San Franciscans that are becoming homeless, suddenly that shifts and their view of homeless people is very different. Um, when police officers um, actually 
uh, you know, have interchanges with people with psychiatric illnesses and they get a firsthand experience of what it's like to experience a psychiatric crisis. Um, when, you know, when they um, are able to move away from an otherness and actually connect with another person, those, those shifts happen. And so it's, it, but it's so difficult and I don't think there's anything magic, but those, those are some ideas. Want to add on this question, uh, sometimes I, I would be asked, um, what what can we do around the Alice Yeko case specifically? And sometimes I would just say, just tell Alice's story to somebody else. Because one of the things that happened, and allows me to go back to something I wanted to mention around media, is that it's these narratives told about whether it's a homeless person or a victim of police brutality, and that impact their control, the police bias narrative controls in the media, uh, in the mass media. So I actually, I'm very supportive of our independent and local press. From my experience of what happened after the Alex Nieto case to what happened after the Luis Gómez Pat case, it was night and day. Yeah. It was incredible. The local and the independent press was incredible. And I'm specifically talking about Mission Local, El Tecolote, KQED, and The Guardian. They went out there, they got the eyewitness narratives, they immediately had an alternative story to the police story, to the point that even the SF Chronicle went out there and got the, got the video that showed how that 30 seconds went by from the moment the police left their car to um, uh, Luis Gómez being killed. <coughs> so I think if you're an artist, if you are a writer, if you can somehow help, if you're a performer and can somehow tell an alternative narrative, you're helping. If you're a neighbor and want to just tell the story of how of the facts as you understand them, not the biased police narrative, you are helping. I like that. Um, in agreement with everything um, that the other panelists have oh, said, okay, <laughs> I, I just believe that it's going to take education and we. <laughs> for sorry, the hills. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> and we as a people, I think we have to stop being afraid of saying racism. And we need to begin to have dialogues around racism. When you talk about uh, the brother up there, talk about the uh, police culture in San Francisco Police Department, it is based on explicit bias and racism. And it's nothing. We have to begin to say it because we have to be truthful. We're not comfortable in using the word racism. And so we need to educate ourselves. We need to begin to have different dialogues in different communities around racism and discrimination and be able to want to deal with what is actually going on in San Francisco because San Francisco has become a racist, discriminatory city that is by the bank, the golden city by the bank. Ms. Ferguson, and we have to begin to attack some of these things that are going on in San Francisco and not be afraid to use the words and call it for what it really is. And right now it's racist and discriminatory. And I will also uh, encourage our brothers and sisters in the labor movement, uh, you know, yeah. not to avoid their responsibility. That's right. To call out uh, many POAs in this country as racist institutions. That's right. And that's a harder discussion to have within the labor movement, mm -hmm. but it's an absolutely necessary Definitely. one. Secondly, I point out that uh, in a city that professes uh, an investment and a belief in the restorative justice model, just up the street from us, 111 Taylor, uh, is a federal halfway house operated by a for profit corporation. Uh, GeoCare, which is owned by the Georges Group, which is one of the four largest prison privatization firms in the world. Yeah. Last year, they made close to $200 million in profit, and their business is locking up black and brown people. That's what they do for a living. And that corporation is housed in a community of color. Um, not only is it an asset that no longer belongs to the community, but we are allowing this for-profit enterprise right. uh, as a part of the prison industrial complex mm -hmm. to operate in our community. Right. We've passed a distur disturbing threshold in our country. We now have, and I've actually misstated this a couple of times, I'll clarify it. We now have more people in prison than we have individuals in public housing. Mm -hmm. 
in this country. And so, in a real sense, the Department of Justice, the Department of Corrections, is the largest developer of affordable housing for minorities in general and young black men in particular. Um, we cannot continue to allow that. Right. Bad things happen when good people do nothing. All right? So everything you do that's not the bad thing is helping. Now, every police station, right, every district police station has a monthly community meeting. Go to it. Speak out. Right? Um, I would uh, gently uh, remind my colleague Felicia that I think we have to do both. It's not an either or strategy. It's not not attending city hall meetings and going to the community. <coughs> we need to do both, right? The city infrastructure is ours, right? And when we absolve ourselves, when we absent ourselves from the political process, we then cede, you know, bad decisions to other people. There was a study by the Public Policy Institute of California that looked at um, the uh, voter participation rates, you know, across race. And increasingly, the electorate, the people who vote, don't look like the people of California. We have more than 7 million eligible uh, voters who are not registered in this state, 185,000 of them in the city and county of San Francisco. And increasingly, more and more decisions are made at the ballot box right and we are letting other people decide make those decisions for us uh, Chris mentioned the 23 local ordinances that we have around controlling the behavior of, of homeless people all passed by local voters and again it's it's typically the communities of color the working class communities of color who need the political process the most that participate the least by and large, I feel, because we don't feel our voice counts. We don't feel that the political process actually represents us. We don't feel that anything we do is going to make a difference. We don't think that our vote is going to make a difference, which turns out to be true when we don't vote. All right? And if voting didn't matter, rich people wouldn't spend so much money trying to keep poor people from voting. Right? I'm old enough to remember my mother having to take a test to vote. One of the OGs in the room, one looking at another one. All right. And the person giving her the test misspelled her name. The name had four letters, R-U-T-H, her name is Ruth. And so we made eye contact at that moment. Just remember what this, what happened here, little Joey. So 50 plus years later, little Joey still remembers that. And the least I can do. I'll concede that voting alone is not enough, because it isn't. But not voting is not helpful. It is not helpful. And so the, in this country, power is vested in the hands of the electorate. That is the reality of our system until we change it. We have to participate. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to our friends. We owe it to our neighbors to participate. Yes. I want to echo what you had just said, but um, when we deal with all these issues about uh, homelessness, racism, and all that, it really, I agree, that goes back to education. And so what are you doing about reaching out that conversation to the school, to the students, whether the parents talk to them or not, especially when the Board of Supervisors currently is considering young adults, 16, 70, be able to vote. Now, if they're not of critical mind thinking or having that conversation to understand that, they're going to just fall into that. So, where, what effort are, are any of are what to do to reach out to that part? I don't know if you've ever heard Uncle Bobby from Musco Grant speak, but he always says it's all it's all about the little kids, and it, it truly is. And one of my favorite things that uh, we've done with the Domestic Violence and the Coalition is either be invited to speak about the case or in the latest collaboration with Loco Broco, we were all interviewed by the kids and they created a critical play. It, uh, first review happened, but it's gonna, I think in September it'll be out. 
And they're gonna talk about the impact of the case on community, which I love from the beginning. It's not so much about the case, yes it is, but it's about what the impact on youth was. And these are youth being critical thinkers. And it's a play for youth. So that's, that's one of my favorite things that has happened. Um, one of the things that Justice for Mario Woods um, Coalition is doing, and I have to tell you, Justice for Mario Woods Coalition is only a five month. We've only been together five months and we've been doing some mighty good work. So we're, we're brand new at this, where other coalitions have been around you know, 20 years, Alex Nieto, I think two, two years, but we're five months and I'm very proud of what we're doing. And um, I do a lot of work in the community. I do a lot of work in uh, high schools and college campuses. And I always talk about what we're doing. I always invite people to come and join. We have over 35 different organizations within our coalition. And so therefore, people go out and spread the word and do what they do in various ways just outside of one or two people. And so, again, it is very important. I think education, education, education is so important. And going back to the brother here on the end, and as far as voting is concerned, and poor people is concerned, we have to educate our people to vote. And, you know, it may be a sad process, but it's a necessary process. And that means we have to go into the housing projects and register people. You know, we don't see, when I was growing up, um, you saw people during the time before elections outside of the um, of these grocery stores and things of that name, tabling. You don't see that anymore, and especially in poor communities. So if we want our people to vote, then we have to make an assertive effort to go and knock on the door, explain to them and educate them why it's important to vote because yes, they do feel that their vote don't count and we have to be the ones to convince them that their vote does count and I vote every every time. So, you know, it's a lot of work to be done and it, we just cannot do it by ourselves and so this is why I, again, I beseech every one of you to get involved in something to the point where it may not be every week coming to Justice for Mario Woods Coalition meetings, but get involved. We have the Fillmore um, Town Hall meeting tomorrow at um, 2097 Turk Street. We're going to have Elaine Brown coming in on the 26th of the Black Panthers to talk about COINTELPRO around movements. We have, um, we're coming to the Tenderloin on June 2nd at Glide doing a town hall. So all these things is about educating people about what is going on, and I think that is the most important thing. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I, uh, uh, you have Coleman Advocates for Children and Youth, their group, their yeah. youth group, uh, Youth Making a Change, is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. Uh, so that's at least one example. You have Kids First over in Oakland. Uh, San Francisco in 1991 was the first city in the country uh, to uh, enact a children's fund where it's set aside in the city budget to fund children and youth services. Um, Oakland replicated that uh, a few years later. Uh, the Kids First campaign, that organization still exists. There is a, a group of philanthropic uh, organizations, foundations, a funders collaborative for youth organizing, which actually supports uh, youth organizing, youth empowerment, youth engagement across the country. Um, uh, the Bay Area has a proud history, right, as being an incubator um, uh, for youth organizing. So there are lots of examples of Causa that, Justa. both here and in. Causa Justa. Causa Justa. Justa. Um, and, you know, I would say uh, oh, against yeah. the backdrop of uh, this push toward um, jobs in the technology field, I'm a firm believer that what we really need more of our artists, uh, we need more musicians, we need more poets, we need more writers, we need more jazz singers. So uh, I, would, uh, I would encourage us to advocate for greater investment. San Francisco is one of the few cities in the country that actually uh, augments the uh, school district budget with its own local money to support arts and music in schools. And it's way late, even though they're country's having a very difficult time now uh, with its uh, infrastructure and its, and its 
which is really in a, a difficult period, but they have a national music program there, El Sistema, and a graduate of that program, uh, Gustavo Dudamel, is actually the director of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. The point of that El Sistema is that every child should have a musical instrument. And so I would encourage us uh, to be telling that story, right? That what music and arts can bring, not only to a child's life, but to our society and our communities at large. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you've been keeping, we've been keeping talking about education, education, okay? I want to find out how the receptive the San Francisco Unified School District as to you having this kind of form within talk about it in, uh, in the high school, especially in the high school right there where the students have not of understanding. You know, I know that there's a, I mean, in, in, in certain organizations, they go to individual classes, but I, I they actually think, I, I was thinking about was the possibility of having it in, in high school, okay, because they understand more, okay, that in the lunch period, okay, when everybody, then, then they could get the, you know, uh, at, at least have a program in the auditorium to have a, to, to have you guys, five of you, uh, you know, uh, talking to, uh, to people in Lowell High School, Galileo, or Washington. Okay. That'll work for me. I mean, because, because when I went to elementary school, you know, they, they have police, policemen going over the classes and, and talk about things, and everybody have good, I mean, all the kids just, just love it, okay? So I think that there's something like that equivalent to it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really happened school by school. And so, um, like Mission High has done a bunch of forums. There's, you know, I think Burton did one. Um, it, you know, all, th and these are all really good ideas. Um, one of the issues always is, is that it's a resource issue. And so and it's, th this is one of the things that people can work on and make happen and contact schools and put together panels and all of that stuff. All of that takes time and effort. And so, um, and you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, volunteer run organizations, um, very underfunded, mostly volunteer organizations like ours uh, that are dealing with a massive number of issues. And so uh, that, that I, I would just encourage folks like the awesome ideas and um, and make it happen. And you know that I think that's you know that's how to make it happen. Well, San Francisco does have a a, 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 youth, a youth commission, right? Uh, now, and youth commissions are now in several counties in the state of California. That's uh, at least one way to get young people involved in both government and community service and the idea of uh, reaching out to their peers as a part of uh, being a part of the democratic process. Um, I know that years ago, uh, United Players, um, you know, that organization started as a result of uh, some racial tensions in Balboa High School, right? And where it was young people, right, who actually diffused a potentially explosive situation. I think that um, for a lot of us OGs, I mean, we can learn a lot from young people. And uh, being able to not only uh, share the stage, but at some point get off the stage so young people can occupy it, I think is absolutely necessary for us. I would also nod to this, um, this wholesale um, forfeiture, actually, and sale of public institutions that is uh, certainly true in public education where we are trying to privatize that. And frankly, were it not for the teachers union in this country, we'd be done with public education. Right now. And so I think we still have a serious struggle on our hands to fight for that democratic uh, uh, institution that is public education in this country and fighting for the absolute necessity to not, you know, arts and music and sports, they are not electives, they are not luxuries, they are essential parts of education. And we've gotten away from that uh, notion over the past uh, 25 years, I believe. Yeah, I'd like to comment that. You know, you mentioned about having unionization workers. I think the one thing that the would be personal, the only way you get accountability, personal meaning parents, PTA in the school, because they dictate how the kids are going to be So look for accountable to what kind of society we want 
parents have to be loud and boss and make sure they're all right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So that, I want to thank again our five amazing panelists. Thank you all for being here and joining us. Uh, thanks to Mendelsniff Theater for hosting us, People Power Media, and 48 Hills, who are co sponsors along with USF's Masters of Urban Planning program.